Hello, I'm Darrell Mudra, and today I want to talk about freedom, the creative edge in sports psychology. Generally, when I start out with a, with a new group of players, uh, I will try to share as many experiences that I've had with them that will help us uh, begin to perceive ourselves as just working at a fraction of our potential. I'll tell them stories like, uh, oh, uh, at Greeley, when I was in a graduate student there, we had a student that scored on the 95th percentile on an entrance test, but he thought he'd taken an IQ test. And he knew that average kids weren't going to do, do well uh, in school. Uh, certainly 95 was a little below average. And by, at Christmas time, he was, he was flunking out of school. And so his parents came up and sat down with a counselor. And when he found out that 90, the 95th percentile meant that he did better on the test than 95% of the kids, it made a dramatic change in the way he performed. What he believed about himself, when he believed that he was average on that IQ test, it really hindered his performance. Um, we've, uh, I, I remember when I was coaching in high school, we had, a track, we had a track meet every spring where we invited the country kids to come in and perform against the city kids. I'd call up all those little school moms and ask them to send their, their uh, elementary school kids in. And one of those elementary kids from the country saw an old broken vaulting pole laying by the vaulting pit and he asked me if he could, if he could have it. And I, naturally I gave it to him and uh, two or three weeks later I was driving through his farm on the way to uh, fish in the Missouri River and I saw where he had dug a hole in the pig fence and he was, he was vaulting over that pig fence with that vaulting pole. Uh, he was about 10 or 11 years old and about five years later, I think when he was a sophomore in high school, I picked up the paper and he'd won the state championship in the vault and that was no accident and I think that could happen to almost any, any kid. It's, he was waiting to, to uh, be motivated. Throughout the presentation, we will illustrate a number of contrasts for which we are searching for explanations. For example, why do some doctors focus on holistic health and others on surgery and drugs? Why do some researchers study perception and others study rats? Why do some organizations prefer leadership to emerge from the ranks and others want blind obedience from the ranks? Why do some believe in creation and others in evolution? Why do some teachers advocate freedom in the classroom and others want constraint in the classroom? Why do some players want to participate in decisions and others want orders from the top? Why does competition sometimes encourage cooperation and other times encourages confrontation? Why do some coaches emphasize motivation from the inside and others emphasize motivation from the outside? Why do we have both the potential to love and also the potential to hate? Why do some value athletics and some value scholarship? We will return to each of these illustrations, but first, a basketball coach shared this experience with me. He said, Coach, this one year, I had a terrible basketball team. We didn't win a, a hardly a game. And uh, at tournament time, we had to play a lot of those same schools that had beaten us 30 and 40 points in the district tournament. And I had a chance to officiate the district tournament in the next county. So I, uh, the superintendent agreed that I could send my B team coach with my team, and I was gone. Well, the B team coach got sick. And the only faculty member that was available to take the team was a home economics teacher. And so she uh, gathered the, the uh, uh, players together and turned the team over uh, to the captain. She said, look, I don't know anything about what you're doing. Just use the same plays you've, you've been using. And uh, she had the captain do the substituting. Well, they won every game. And when they came back home, they were so excited and they could hardly believe uh, what, what they had accomplished. And the, the coach called them together and, he, and, and asked me, he said, well, fellas, what in the world happened? And they said, coach, most of the time you really dominated us. And most of the time we felt like it was your team, like it was your basketball team. And we sort of liked to see you lose. They hadn't realized it, but when they had the responsibility, when it was their game to win or lose, when they were making the decisions, it made a tremendous difference. And uh, just that one single experience uh, caused us to realize how many more things is possible for these kids to do than they actually do. Tom Peters has a chapter in his book In Search of Excellence called Man Waiting for Motivation. And I'll bet I've read a thousand uh, textbooks on learning theory and 
thousands of articles uh, uh, about learning. And I think this is the best thing that I've come across uh, uh, to give us some insights into the learning process. Uh, one of the things that, that, uh, that I remember very vividly is he said that we are simultaneously flawed and wonderful. There's just an awful lot of paradox in this whole business of understanding the learning process. Uh, his chapter was called Man Waiting for Motivation. And the essence of it was that every company really has people that are waiting to be motivated. Every team that I coach has players and coaches that are waiting to be motivated. And that the big variable is not the difference between the players that I have and the players that I have to play against. But the big variable is the difference is, is what the players are like what I, when I get them and what they could be like. They're players waiting to be motivated. In my first college coaching,